All right, let's continue. Last week we left off with uh, the reason Satan hates us. God, we're made in God's image. Now, we can spend days and days on this topic. It's a moral image. Uh, it's also, we, we have a trinity. We have a body, soul, and spirit. God is uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you can, there's whole books, you can take whole courses on that, so I'm going to refrain from getting distracted too far. We'll never get done. But to Hitler is quoted as saying, uh, if you tell a lie long enough and loud enough and often enough, the people will believe it. He also said that people are more likely to, to believe a big lie than a small one. And it's surprisingly true. If I told you, you know, I worked a job and I made, uh, you know, $40,000, people people, oh, you really? But if I say I worked a job and made $1,000, ah, you did not. <laughs> They'll believe it if it's a bigger lie somehow. You know, just people are that way. I've got uh, two older brothers and a younger sister. I was raised in East Peoria, Illinois. When I was about six years old, I came running into the breakfast table one morning, and I got the last banana out of the bowl to put on my cereal. And a few minutes later, my two big brothers came in. <clears throat> they said, hey, Kent, is that the last banana? I said, yep, and I got it. Any of you have an older brother or sister? You know that wonderful feeling when you finally pull one over on them? Boy, they pick on you all the time. That morning, I had them, and I knew it. They wanted my banana. But big brothers do not beg their little brother for anything. <clears throat> they just beat him up and take it away. <laughs> so my brother said, Kent, do you know how bananas are made? I said, no. They said, well, down in South America, they have these spiders that live up in the trees, and all their legs fold up when they die, and mold begins to grow on the dead spider legs, and a banana is actually made from moldy spider legs. And I said, you guys are lying to me. You just want this banana because you know it's the last one. They said, no, brother, we're not lying. You cut that thing in half and look in the middle, you can still see the black spots where his legs were. I gave him my banana that morning, by the way. <laughs> I wasn't about to eat that thing. And uh, I did not eat bananas for nearly three years after that. If you want somebody to believe a lie, you have to mix it in with some truth. And that's what Satan has always done. When he quoted Scripture to Jesus, he always quoted partial Scriptures. If you read Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus is up on the mountain, you know, being tempted of the devil, well, Satan's technique was always, and all the cults do the same thing. They quote part of a scripture. They mix a little bit of truth in with their lie, and it's just a technique that it works. I mean, that's what they've been using for years for rat poison. Same idea. You mix two things together. Rat poison is 99.995% good food. There is very little poison in rat poison. If I gave you a glass of water with two drops of arsenic in it. Would you drink it? Well, it's mostly good water, but it's, it's the poison that's going to get you, right? Now, I'm afraid that television is about the same way. There might be a lot of good stuff on there, but there's little bits of poison in there once in a while that'll, that'll it'll get to you. It'll absolutely destroy you if you're not careful. They always seem to have, you know, kid, people say, oh, it's a good show, it's only got a few bad words. Well, think about it now. It's a good show, it's only got a few bad scenes. This is the same idea, to slowly get into your mind. Uh, they do this to sell Marlboro cigarettes. I share with my seminar, you know, how that they mix Marlboro cigarettes in with cowboys, as if there's some kind of connection. Now, you have to learn to, to, to watch for this, because this is a brainwashing technique. To sort of somebody associates smoking with being a macho cowboy. They've seen them together all the time, and now they make, they make the association psychologically. Well, they must, man, if I start smoking Marlboro, I'll be a cowboy. That's simply not true, of course. They do the same thing with beer. They you know, always associate beer with sports. I tell people, stop and think about that. What is the connection between beer and sports? Do you want your quarterback full of beer when he's out there calling the plays? Do you want those guys in Indianapolis 500? You know, do you want them going 200 miles an hour, tanked up on beer? Watch the world heavyweight champion boxing. They're out there slugging it out. What's right on the mat under their feet? <laughs> Budweiser. I tell them it's not Budweiser, it's Bud Stupid. Or Bud Dumber. You know, <laughs> they call it Budweiser, but it doesn't make them any wiser, that's for sure. The Bible is real clear about the subject. Uh, don't touch alcohol. Now, who hath woe? They that tarry long at the wine. Let me just kick this dog as we walk by. In the English language, uh, we have some words that are kind of limited. For instance, we have one word, love, which has many different meanings. I love pizza. I love my wife. I love my dog. Those are different kinds of love. And we, we know automatically what you mean by the sentence it's used in. We know which kind of love you're talking about. 
in the Greek language, they were kind of limited in, in some other areas. Uh, they have many different words for love, but they only have one word for wine where we would have several words. We would have grape juice, grape jelly, grape syrup, alcoholic wine. So there are many different words that we have in English that they did not have in the Greek. They had one word. If it comes from the grape, it's called wine. It does not mean it is fermented. Which is why the Bible says in Proverbs 23, they that talking about they that tarry long at the wine, then you see in Proverbs 23, 31, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red. Now think about it. That means there is a time when it isn't red. It's still called wine, but once it ferments, if you read this passage carefully, when it's red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright, when it begins to stir itself as it ferments. So some people say Jesus drank wine. No, he didn't. Not our kind of wine. He made, turned the water into wine, which was grape juice, and they drank it the same day. And Jesus could not have drank alcoholic wine because he would have gone against what the Scripture says. And he didn't violate any Scriptures. So the whole problem comes from the limited Greek language in that particular word, and English has more words to describe that. Anytime you translate, you have that problem. Uh, Tanya, you speak Russian, you know, you try to, sometimes there just isn't a good word to, to put in, you know, for what do you mean by that? And sometimes, sometimes it takes a whole sentence to describe what one word says. And this is a case with wine. The Bible's real clear in Habakkuk chapter 2, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink. There's a curse on those that supply alcohol to other people. There's a curse on those that drive the beer truck. There's a curse on those that give out the wine. I just, there's a curse on them. I don't want a curse on my life. I, I couldn't take a job as a stewardess on an airplane for fear God would be upset with me because I'd have to serve the first class passengers alcohol when they ask for it. I, I, I couldn't work in a store if I had to serve alcohol. I, could, I wouldn't want to be a waitress or a waiter if I had to do that. I know some people that have stood their grounds and said, this is my conviction. I'll come work at your store. I'll be a good waiter, et cetera, et cetera, but I won't touch the alcohol. And look, if you're a good worker, the boss will give you something else to do. But that just Habakkuk's a good verse to consider. There is a curse on those that uh, drink alcoholic beverages and those that even serve it to other people. Now, I tell people, you know, so one kid said, don't you, what's the matter, Brother Hovind, don't you like beer? I said, I don't know, I've never tasted it. I'm 47, never had a drop in my life. I've had NyQuil a few times. But, and then he said, well, how do you know you won't like it if you don't try it? And I always respond by saying, well, that's a brilliant way to live. Uh, let me ask you a question. Have you ever laid your head under a semi-truck? Well, how do you know you won't like it if you don't try it? <laughs> you don't have to try everything to know if it's good or bad, okay? There are other ways to learn. And any kid dumb enough to fall for that thing, well, you've got to try it to know if you'll like it. Look, that's not, you know, have you ever jumped off the building into the he concrete head first? You ever poke your eye with an ice pick? I mean, <laughs> no. You don't have to do things to know if it's good or bad. You can figure it out some other ways, you know. One good way is to read what God's Word says. Another good way is to talk to somebody who's older. You know, you get these seventh graders taking advice from fellow seventh graders. <laughs> that's real brilliant. Man, ask somebody who's been around the block a few times. They can give you some wisdom. I like sitting and talking to the old people, you know, these 70, 80, 90 year olds. It's unbelievable some of the stuff they come up with. It's just, they've been around, you know. They've learned a few things. Um, what's happening though, the, the idea of mixing good and bad together is exactly what's happening in our textbooks. Science textbooks, and I have a huge collection of them, there's a lot of good science in them, okay? But there's some poison mixed with it. If you analyzed rat food, you would find out it's mostly good food. And I'm not objecting to good food, it's the poison that's bad. And I'm not objecting to science, but it's the poison mixed in with the science. And this is how they get by with it. They will say, oh, the book's awfully good. Yeah, but what about the poison in there? Let me show you something. Here's a first grade textbook. They tell the kids in first grade, Earth has changed much since its formation four and a half billion years ago. They start off with a first grader telling him the Earth is four and a half billion years old. Now this is the teacher's edition, so what I'm showing is what's in the margin for the, for the teacher to teach the kids. <coughs> teach the kids the Earth is four and a half billion years old. Now, if you tell that to a first grader, he's going to believe you. Don't you think it's reasonable that the first grader should be able to go to school, listen to the teacher, and believe what they say? I mean, they ought to be able to, shouldn't they? 
So the humanists know in order to get their religion believed by the majority, they have to start with the kids when they're really young. Start in first grade. They tell them again in second grade. Since its formation, four and a half billion years ago, Earth has changed. At the bottom they say life too has evolved on Earth. Now right here we've got to take some time and one of the quiz questions next week will be the six different meanings of the word evolution. This is how the kids get confused every time. I have learned the hard way after doing what 46 debates now on over 4,000 radio and TV call and talk shows. If you want to win a debate on evolution, it's very simple. You first define the word. When somebody says, do you believe in evolution, you have to say, what do you mean? Because there are six different meanings to the word. Number one, we have cosmic evolution, which is more commonly known as the Big Bang. Has anybody ever observed a Big Bang produce anything orderly? As best I remember, Big Bangs produce big messes. Ask the folks in Hiroshima that survived that Big Bang about 60 years ago, right? Ask the folks in uh, Iraq that survived all the Big Bangs we sent over there, you know, <laughs> several years ago. Cosmic evolution would be the origin of time, space, and matter. Remember we mentioned how God is a trinity from Genesis 1.1. Uh, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth as a reference to time, space, and matter right there in Genesis 1.1. The Big Bang is an alternative substitute way to explain how we got time, space, and matter. The Bible starts off and says, in the beginning, God. Now, if you can believe those first four words, the rest of the Bible is easy to believe. God created time, space, and matter. According to the evolution, the Big Bang created time, space, and matter. They attribute the same characteristics that God has to Big Bang, able to produce time, space, and matter. The second definition of the word, after the Big Bang uh, supposedly exploded, the Big Bang, according to the evolutionists, would produce hydrogen and possibly a little bit of helium. The sun is hydrogen and helium. The question then would come, how do we get the other elements? Where do we get lithium and carbon and oxygen and you know neon and all these 92 elements plus the synthetic ones we have? Where do we get these elements? You'd have to have really billions of years of chemical evolution. Now, the answer the evolutionists often give to this one is, well, stars are so hot, they're able to produce higher elements from just the heat. Okay, well, where did the energy come from then? You're going to have to have either matter or energy, one or the other. I mean, yes, stars do produce a lot of heat and sometimes produce other elements, some of the higher elements. But all of the um, reactions we see in nature, we see uranium decay to lead. Potassium decays to argon. They're all downward. We don't see any upward ones without enormous energy input. So the question is, how did we get the higher elements? They don't talk about this hardly at all, but it is a real serious obstacle. You'd have to go through a stage of chemical evolution. Then after that, you'd have to have stellar, which means stars, stellar and planetary evolution. How did the stars form? I mean, you walk outside, you take a look, there's a lot of stars up there. <coughs> Estimates are every person on Earth could have two trillion of them <laughs> per person. So where did they come from? One atheist was trying to answer this question one time, and he said, well, don't you know, Dr. Oven, if, if 20 stars explode near each other, <coughs> they'll produce enough energy to create a star. <laughs> I said, well, think about it. You got to lose 20 to gain one? You sound like a Democrat trying to borrow your way out of debt. You know? <laughs> if you're losing 20 to gain one, it looks like a losing proposition to me, doesn't it? First place, nobody's ever seen that happen. It's just theoretical that it could happen if 20 exploded. That's just all theoretical. Nobody's ever observed it. Now, since science deals what we can observe, we can test, we can demonstrate, this part of evolution is not science. It's part of their religion. It would have to happen, though. It'd have to happen a whole bunch of times. I mean trillions of times because there's a lot of stars up there. Number four, you'd have to have organic evolution. That is basically the origin of life. How did life get started from non-living material? We will cover a whole lot more on that experiments they've tried to do to create life in the laboratory. Back when we get to uh, my, what's on my video number four, it'll probably be several years before we get there at the rate we're going in this course, but uh, we cover the origin of life. It's absolutely hasn't happened. Nowhere close. 
One, one student, I was in a debate one time at University of West Florida, and this smart aleck student stood up, and he said, oh, Dr. Hoven, uh, what would you say if a bunch of intelligent scientists someday create life in the laboratory? I said, well, first place, there's absolutely no place, nowhere close to it. They can't even get the amino acids to stick together very good, and that's just a small building block. I said, secondly, I would have to say, if a bunch of intelligent scientists produce life in the laboratory, that would prove it takes intelligence to create life which is what I've been saying all along. <laughs> it would actually prove creation, wouldn't it? It certainly wouldn't prove evolution. It wouldn't prove it could happen by itself, by chance, over billions of years. And it hasn't been done. They're absolutely nowhere close. Step number five, you would have to have macroevolution. This is the origin of major kinds. There are quite a few different kinds of animals. Where did they come from? When you get into a discussion on evolution, I would encourage you to avoid using the word species. The Bible says the animals will bring forth after their kind. Now just stick with what the Bible says and you'll be fine. Because if you get into a discussion on species, somebody's going to prove to you that a dog and a wolf are different species. And the, Well, by our classification system, they are. There's Canis lupus and Canis domesticus, and they're different species. I point out, well, they're interfertile. A dog and a wolf can breed and produce puppies. So there really is no good solid definition of species. I would say there probably also is not a good solid definition of the word kind. But if you put a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana on the table and bring in a three-year-old and say, which one is not like the others? He could probably tell you, it's the banana, right? A horse and a zebra are the same kind of animal. It's obviously not like a tomato, right? I'm not sure exactly where the border is between the different kinds. There probably is a little room, for that, and that'd be a good area of study. That's an area worthy of study. But it's pretty obvious when there are different kinds of animals. Most of the cases are clear-cut obvious. Some are a little questionable. Okay, we can study the fringe if you'd like, but let's not waste time focusing on the fringe. Let's look at the bigger picture. The sixth and final definition of evolution is microevolution. That is variations within the kind. Now, this one is scientific. This happens all the time. That's what farmers do for a living, isn't it? They try to produce a particular breed that's good for their particular area. You know, if they happen to live in cold climates, they try to get a cow that can survive the cold climate. Down in Texas, where it's hot, they produce the, the Brahma bull, you know, what can stand the heat. Then you get the Angus that has real good beef. And so when you're in a right kind of temperature area, you combine the two and get a Brangus, which has both heat resistance and good beef. Farmers spend a fortune trying to develop a variety that's good for their area, even varieties of cotton for certain kinds of soil. But see, variation within the kind, I, I actually object to the word microevolution because that's what confuses the kids. But they're using it anyway, so we, we're kind of stuck with their term, okay? See, when they define the terms, it makes the arg argument a little tougher. The first five are religious. They have never been observed. I did a debate in El Paso, Texas a couple weeks ago, and first thing I did, I gave the six different meanings of the word evolution. I said, now folks, number six is scientific. I wouldn't argue about that. Bacteria become resistant to drugs after a while. I won't argue about that. It's still a bacteria. Roaches become resistant to pesticides. It's still a roach. And there's a limit to the variation. They probably never will become resistant to a sledgehammer. Okay, there is, There's a limit in there someplace, right? So what's going to happen, scientists or evolution teachers are going to give thousands of examples of microevolution, which is indeed true. And then they somehow, by association, make the kids believe that all six of those go together. And it, it's, it's, it ought to be illegal to do that, okay? It's called bait and switch. You get them to, you know, offer them one definition of evolution, you know, variation within the kind. Most of the textbooks will say something like, uh, evolution is change in a species over time. And that sounds real innocent, and that's true. Aren't you probably, don't you probably look different than your grandpa? Yeah. Does that prove you came from a rock? Uh, no. <laughs> you see what I mean? Certainly doesn't prove the Big Bang or any other thing else up there. That's all fairy tale stuff. And if you will learn those six different meanings of the word evolution, 
And whenever you get into a debate or an argument on the subject, just simply stop and say, what do you mean by evolution? And if they say, well, things change. Oh, yeah, I, I agree. I believe that. Oh, you believe in evolution? Well, I believe things change. I believe the change is limited to whatever information is already in the gene code. That doesn't prove a turtle and a banana are related, that's for sure. It might be that all the 500 varieties of turtles came from maybe only 10 turtles in the Garden of Eden. I don't know how many kinds God made. And today there's probably a lot of new varieties, but still, there's still a turtle. So be very careful. You can win the argument every time, if you all, and you've got to watch for it, because they will constantly try to blur the border between micro and macro. And they're missing the entire point of the other phases of evolution. Those are the six meanings. And if you just keep, you keep hammering on that, eventually they'll either get mad and go away, or they will get, they will get converted. Because those, that's to me, is the whole crux of the argument. The teachers are taught in the teacher's manuals, be sure to stress that the earth is billions of years old. Make sure the kids believe this. If I told you a dog came from a rock because somebody gave it a pill, yeah, that's stupid, right? But in the science textbook, they teach the dog came from the rock over billions of years. So if it happens slowly, you know, maybe, it's, maybe that happened. <laughs> it's, it's still a fairy tale, okay? It doesn't happen. Time's not going to change it. You know, you say the, the, the man flew through the air, you know, like on the, uh, some kind of fairy tale. Well, it's obviously a fairy tale if the guy goes flying through the air. But what if he goes slowly walking through the air? Is that, still, is that less of a fairy tale? The whole thing that happens with evolution is they try to hide behind billions of years ago as if that'll make a difference. And it doesn't make any difference. Okay, the first law of thermodynamics. The word thermo, where we get our word thermometer, means heat. We will ask you to define thermodynamics. Dynamics is where we get our word for dynamite, which means power. So thermodynamics is heat power. One of the universal laws, the first universal law here, thermodynamics, tells us matter cannot be created or destroyed. If you change something from one state to another, you burn the tree, you change it into ash and energy, in the process something is lost that can never be regained. When you burn the gasoline in your car, your car engine, if it's really tuned up well, is probably about 30% efficient. Most of the exploding gasoline, the energy in there is wasted as heat. That's why you have to have a radiator to keep the engine cooled down. If you could get an engine 100% efficient, it, <laughs> it'd get 500 miles to the gallon. But so much is wasted as heat. Your body right now, we're in a room that's about 70 degrees and your body's 98 degrees. All that extra heat is heating the room, which eventually will go out and heat the yard, which eventually heats up the world and <laughs> dissipates. And it's lost, and cannot be regained. So the first law of thermodynamics says matter cannot be created or destroyed, which raises the obvious question, what started it all? It had to start someplace. Let's take about a two-minute break. Stand up, turn around, stretch. So the word thermodynamics simply means heat power. There are three different laws of thermodynamics. We'll get into the first and second one. The third one, I don't remember what it was. Nobody ever uses it anyway. But uh, it's one of those things you learn in physics class and then you forget. But uh, if matter cannot be created or destroyed, and sometimes this, this is phrased a little different, but this is the same concept. Basically, it says it can only be changed from one form to another. You can change matter to energy. I can burn a piece of wood and turn it into heat. It's very difficult to change the energy back to matter, though it can be done. Uh, but there's such a loss. Every time there's a loss of irretrievable energy that eventually everything will experience what is called a heat death. The universe will all cool down. It'll be uniformly cold everywhere. Um, now, since matter cannot be created or destroyed, this leaves us two choices to explain how the world got here. We are here. So there are only two choices of how we got here. Number one, somebody made this world. And this is where you get into, okay, which, who made it? Well, there's all sorts of options there. You know, is it Allah or Jehovah or God or Buddha or whatever, you know? 
That's where you get into all the different religions of which one is right. Uh, but the fact is, it basically breaks down into two categories. Somebody made it, or it made itself. Now, if you want to say it made itself, well, then you're in the category of there is no God, the atheistic category. If you're, an, if you're a theist, a person who believes there is a God, then you would have to then start to figure out, okay, which God? And what's he like? And why did he do it? You know, those kind of questions. There are some people who would create a third category. They would say, oh, we're not really here at all. We just think we're here. <laughs> I think you can forget about those folks, okay? We are here. So either somebody made it like the Bible says, God created the heaven and the earth, or it made itself like the humanists say. The Humanist Manifesto, uh, 1933, first plank was, Humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. Now, the Humanist Manifesto was rewritten and revised in 1973. That's the Humanist Manifesto II. That might be a good question. Humanist Manifesto, 1933. One of the signers of the Humanist Manifesto was a guy named John Dewey. John Dewey went to, I believe, Vermont and became the leader of the Teachers College. Under his direction, they produced many humanist leaders who went off and became leaders of major colleges and universities around the world, which then turned out thousands and thousands of humanist-believing teachers, which then went out and took over the school system. Education was infiltrated to a, a large part of the blame can go on John Dewey, who was one of the signers of Humanist Manifesto, 1933. So we'll get into education more, but John Dewey um, and his philosophy of humanism. See, really, it goes, boils down to this. If there is no God, then we better get together and figure out how to run this world, because it's up to us, right? So we end up with man's wisdom. Twice in the Bible, it says, Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Well, if there is no God, then how do you decide right from wrong? I often ask people, you know, if, if they believe in evolution, I say, well, how do, you t how do you tell right from wrong? Think about it. What is sin if evolution is true? There's no way to tell, is there? You don't have a standard, nothing to measure it against. But the humanists believe the universe is self-existing and not created. Well, this, of course, is rather difficult to believe, and the devil knew it would be hard to believe. So he had to think up some way to sound scientific that the world could make itself. And over the years, many theories have been proposed to explain how the world can make itself. There's been the nebular hypothesis, was real popular for a long time. The current one today is called the Big Bang Theory. How many have heard of the Big Bang Theory? That is the current uh, way to explain how the universe got here without a creator, which of course really doesn't explain a thing, because they're just giving to some mythical uh, name, Big Bang, they're giving it the same characters that God has. Big Bang created time, space, and matter. The Bible says God created time, space, and matter. So they're trying to accomplish the same thing, explain why we're here, and what, you know, who are we, why are we here, where are we going when we die, and those kind of things, without God. So the Big Bang has to, would be their idea of the beginning. Here's a typical textbook uh, used in Escambia County right here in Pensacola, Florida. It was, I don't know if it still is, but it's a 92 edition. How was the universe born, and how will it end? Now, look at that first question. Isn't that going back to the four basic questions of life? Who are we? Where did we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going when it ends, when it's all over, when we die? Every religion tries to answer that. So what they're doing here is introducing a religious concept in the schools to explain something that every human wants to know, some of the basic questions of life. Most astronomers believe. Now, look at that sentence. What does that say to the average freshman kid in high school? Well, most astronomers believe this, therefore it must be true. You see how it becomes truth by majority opinion. Dangerous thing to do, okay? In the first place, how do you prove most astronomers believe that? They don't offer any evidence for how they prove that. They just make the statement. I could say, everybody knows Fords are better than Chevys. Which is, first place, 
probably not true, but uh, <laughs> if just because I make the statement and sound dogmatic when I make it, that doesn't make it true, does it? That's a judgment call. And this is a judgment call, but think of the impression this makes on a freshman who's taken this course, or an eighth grader in this case, general science. Most astronomers believe, well, what's the kid going to think? He's 13 years old. Well, I better believe it too then. Isn't, isn't that what's going to happen? Most astronomers believe that about 18 to 20 billion years ago, I'd like to stop right there and point out, this date changes all over the scale. I've seen some say the Big Bang was 8 billion years ago. It ranges, I, you see every number between 8 and 20 billion published. The fact is, it's long ago and far away. That's what they're trying to get across. Now, one of the things I do that is extremely effective when you're trying to talk to an evolutionist or a person who just doesn't know what they believe, even if I'm on the airplane, riding on the airplane, and sitting next to somebody, we get into a discussion, you know, what do you do? You know, I'm evangelist, I speak on dinosaurs in the Bible. Of course, they want to know what? I get my napkin out or whatever, one of the, you know, barf bags on the airplane or something, and I draw these two lines. I have learned that if you just simply say 18 to 20 billion years ago, the kid reads that, the brain cannot absorb big numbers. Congress knows that. It takes advantage of it all the time. So by showing it on a graph, all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow. Something clicks between what you're seeing now and what you're hearing and what you're thinking. It all seems to fit together. So by graphing it out, I, I, on my napkin I'll make two lines, and I'll label one 6,000 years ago, creation, 4,400 years ago, flood, 2,000 years ago, Jesus' life, here we are today. By the way, I put the word today instead of a date because my chart would go out of date every year if I did that, right? <laughs> then I draw their graph, 20 billion years ago, Big Bang. And I ask, often ask them the question, what exploded and where did it come from? And the obvious question is, what was before that? But if you graph it out, all of a sudden they can see it's, it's, it's still it's dumb. But somehow the visual of being able to see what they believe on a timeline helps them to realize how dumb it is. Otherwise, they would just simply believe it because it's, 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 it's a mental gymnastic. And then 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth cooled down, which is what the textbooks teach. And 3 billion years ago, life evolved. Some say 3.8. It doesn't matter. The concept is still the same. Okay. And then this life had to, then you have to have macro evolution to get to various life forms. All six meanings of the word evolution can be found on the chart. Cosmic evolution, that'd be the Big Bang. Sometime in here you'd have to have chemical evolution, the st chemicals would have to evolve. Then you'd have to have stellar evolution, the stars and planets have to evolve. They would teach the Earth was one of the last ones for planetary evolution at right here. Then you have to get uh, origin of life, organic evolution. Organic means living. And then you have to have macroevolution, changes between kinds. And finally, way at the end, you get a little bit of microevolution, variations within the kind. And from here on is all we've observed. All the rest of this is imagination. But by putting it on a graph, all of a sudden they start to see, wow, that is silly, isn't it? So the textbook tells, tells the kids, 18 to 20 billion years ago, all the matter in the universe. By the way, the word universe is a question we should ask about. Universe comes from two Latin words. Uni means single, a unicycle. Verse means a spoken sentence. You have verse and prose. So a universe, the word itself means a single spoken sentence. We live in a single spoken sentence. God said, let there be. See, God spoke everything into existence. Now, everything I've ever built took effort on my part, right? God spoke and created. I can't comprehend that for sure. That's called infinite power. You know, when God speaks, the waves lay down, the wind stops, the dead come to life. The rocks cry out. Everything in the universe obeys His voice, except us. We're the only ones he's having a little trouble with right now, but <laughs> he will fix that someday too, when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. But for now, he's having a little, tr little trouble with us. But he just spoke. Now, that's a powerful thought, that we live in a universe. And I use it on the evolutionists all the time. You know, we live in a universe. 
single spoken sentence. This textbook says all the matter in the universe was concentrated into one very dense, very hot region. Now hold, stop right there. Where did the gravity come from to make it pull together very, t very dense? Where did the heat come from? I mean, that's energy. They don't offer any explanation for that. They just say, boys and girls, here's how it happened. Now they get mad at us for saying, in the beginning, God. Where did God come from? Oh, stop right there. Where did your matter come from? Where did your energy come from? Where did your gravity come from? They don't have any answers either, do they? It's just as much a religion as what we have. The point is, both are religious. The problem is, this religion is tax-supported. That's why I offer in my ministry a quarter of a million dollars for anybody with any real, hard, scientific evidence for evolution. I get lots of letters because of that offer on my website. Uh, even the billboard we put up in St. Louis, right next to the St. Louis uh, Museum, where they have the Temple to Darwin, basically is what it is. Um, people would say, oh, no, of course we can't prove evolution. Can you prove creation? Ha, ha, ha. But that's exactly what I want them to say. I respond by saying, no, no, I cannot prove creation, and you cannot prove evolution. So my question is, since neither of us can prove what we believe, why do I have to pay for your religion to be taught in the schools? Shuts them up every time. Because that's a religion, folks. You believe 20 billion years ago, all the matter in the universe was in a very tiny dot, smaller than a period on a page? What would it take to put all the matter in the universe into a dot the size of a period? That'd take a lot of pressure, wouldn't it? This is fairy tale stuff. But somehow, remember, if you tell a big lie, people are more likely to believe it. When this Big Bang Theory first got started, they said all the matter in the universe was in a sphere, I think they said 70,000 light years across. About 10 or 15 years later, they said, no, it was only 10,000 light years across. It keeps getting smaller and smaller. Now it's down to a dot. Guess what's coming after the dot? Nothing at all. What they're telling the kids here is, we have an explanation for where we came from, where are we going when we die, who are we, the purpose of life. It's all right here, folks. They're offering the same thing. But now, it's godless. You're the result of an accident. There is no real purpose to life. Isn't that what this boils down to? We all got here by chance. Which basically means, hey, you might as well have fun, because there is nothing to life. You're nothing but stardust. This destroys kids' faith. It destroys everything about them. This textbook says, by the way, used in Escambia County, all the matter in the universe, all the matter and energy will once again be packed into a small area, after many billions of years, of course. This area may be no bigger than the period at the end of this sentence. Then another Big Bang will occur. The formation of a universe will begin all over again. A universe that periodically expands and then contracts back on itself is called a closed universe. In a closed universe, a Big Bang may occur once every 80 to 100 billion years. Talk about fairy tale stuff. <laughs> What they're trying to do here is avoid the obvious question, where did the Big Bang, where did the matter come from? Oh, well, it came from a previous Big Bang. You see how they're trying to do that? That's like some of the you know, Hindu religions, you know, where did God come from? Well, he came from a previous God. Oh, where did that one come from? <laughs> well, he came from one before that, you know. This is what the Mormon religion teaches. They teach, as I am, God once was. As God is, I shall be. It's one of their slogans. They teach God was a man, like us, and if you're a good Mormon, you get to go be a God someday and start your own universe. So it avoids the ultimate question of how did it begin? Oh, it's just, it's just always been. It's always, it's always been. That's what they're trying to say here. 18 or 20 billion years ago, there's going to be you know, a big bang, there was a big bang, and then in another 80 billion years, it's going to close up and start over again. This textbook says, nothing really means nothing. This guy's real smart, right? <laughs> he said, not only matter and energy would disappear, but also space and time. However, 
physicists theorized that from this state of nothingness, the universe began in a gigantic explosion. <laughs> now here we have 16.5 billion years ago. I told you the number ranges all over the scale from 8 to 20, right? Remember, it started off with a, a big, big dot, you know, 70,000 light years across. Now it's down to a dot. Now it's down to nothing. nothing That's what I asked him. <laughs> Excuse me? Nothing exploded, and here we are. Huh? Oh, that, that, that sounds good. <laughs> well, if you tell a big lie, people are more likely to believe it. Do you understand how many millions of Americans believe that? Do you understand how many kids got taught that and believed it today? in our school system within 10 miles of where I'm standing? <laughs> Think about it. Think about the ramifications of that. If a kid believes that, what's his image of himself? I'm nothing but dirt, nothing but chemicals. See, the Christian image, you're made in God's image. God loves you. He's got a purpose for you. You get a bunch of kids believing that, there's no telling what they're going to do. One of the two boys that shot everybody in Colorado, both of the boys were strong believers in evolution and followers of Charles Darwin's teachings. One of them had on his t-shirt, natural selection, when they found him dead in the hallway. That's where it leads, folks. Hey, there's no God. I had a kid sit in the second row in a public school I spoke at in Pennsylvania. He said, Mr. Hoven, I'm an atheist. I said, really? He said, yep, there is no God. I said, are you sure? He said, oh yeah, I'm sure. I said, well, tell me, son, if you're an atheist, how do you determine right from wrong? He said, oh, that's easy. I decide if something's right or wrong. He said, I'm the God of my own universe. I said, boy, I'm glad to hear about that, son, because I'm going to shoot you in five minutes. He said, you can't do that. I said, oh yeah, you see, I'm the God of my own universe, and I decided it's fine for me to shoot you. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with that logic? Hey, if there is no God, <laughs> the strongest survive, right? If I can take it away and I'm bigger than you, well, it's just your tough luck. Doesn't the lion do that with the zebra when he gets hungry? I'm taking your life away so I can eat. This type of thinking leads toward, le leads to, the logical conclusion is, there is no such thing as right and wrong, so might makes right. This kind of thinking leads to Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Paul Pott. We get into a lot more on that in video number five about the, how communism and Marxism and Nazism all ties in with evolution. It all starts, you have to get rid of God, which then, if there is no God, who's the next most likely candidate to be the uh, king of the universe? Man, humanism has to have evolution. That's why it's the humanist worldview. Deify mankind. Ye shall be as gods. Exactly what Lucifer said. And that's what's going on. That's how it ties together. This is Scientific American, which is a major science journal. I want you to look what this author said. The observable universe could have evolved, remember, six meanings to that word, Okay. from an infinitesimal region, which means a dot. It's then tempting to go one step further and speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. <laughs> they put this in a science book and call it science? I'd call it a fairy tale and put it in the garbage. That doesn't explain anything. Science is what we know, what we can observe, what we can test. You can't know or observe or test that. That's wild speculation. He's guessing, folks. He doesn't know a thing. Um, <clears throat> according to the Big Bang Theory, there's several different, several different aspects to this. One of the Big Bang Theories says that a bunch of nothings all over exploded <coughs> and produced all the galaxies. So it happened all simultaneous. Oh, that, that explains it real good, you know. Another one says it was all in one dot and exploded and flew out in all directions. Another one, called the Nebula Hypothesis, says this cloud of dust all got together. Of course, obviously the question is, where did all this dust come from, right? But all this dirt in the universe got together in a little bitty tiny dot, and it kept getting drawn in tighter and tighter, and of course it began to spin. Now, the idea that the universe was spinning 
which is what the textbooks teach. It's spun faster. This is important because if you go out and look at the planets or the sun or the earth or the stars, everything seems to be spinning. So where did this spinning motion come from? Doesn't it take energy to make something turn around? They either have to have each planet and star and sun and moon start spinning on its own somehow, which is quite a stretch, you know. Why is everything spinning? Or they have to say the initial object was spinning, and that's where that's why all the fragments are spinning. If there was a big bang, you know, this initial object was spinning <coughs> and exploded. They're faced with a pretty unpleasant choice. Neither one is logical, scientific, uh, certainly not scientifically provable. They say this nebula began to spun, it spun faster and faster, and finally it exploded <coughs> with a big bang. Of course, obvious questions are, where did the energy come from? Where did the matter come from? You know, who made this big bang anyway? And they don't try to answer, offer any answer to that. Here's my two timelines. And again, I found this is absolutely the most effective way to, to get the point across. The evolutionists believe 20 billion years ago there was a big bang. The Christian believes 6,000 years ago God created. We believe in the beginning God. They believe in the beginning dirt. They're in the same boat we are trying to answer how did it start. Now you have to watch. I do debates frequently and I, I it's in a, where was I last week? Knoxville, Tennessee, no, Coleman, Alabama the week before that. The article that came out in the paper, somebody faxed it to me. Oh, they blasted me up one side and down. They always wait till I'm gone, you know, <laughs> and then blast me when I get out there to defend myself. After I left El Paso, Texas back in uh, October 99, the news article came out, and look at the title here. Religious and scientific leaders debate evolution. Now think for a second. What is the unspoken message here? What they're trying to imply is evolution belongs with religion. In other words, those who believe the Bible are religious and everybody else is scientific. Evolution, evolution is combined with science is what they're trying to say. Just by the title, is it religious and scientific leaders debate evolution? Or is it uh, creation religion and evolution religion? See, they're both religions, but the news media always seems to always put the slant that, uh, you know, if you believe the Bible, you're not scientific. The unspoken message, there's a lot of unspoken messages here. The Bible isn't part of science. Religion isn't part of science. Isn't that what they're trying to say? There's a difference between religion and science? They do this all the time, and you've got to watch for it. Yes, sir? Many, sci many scientists do also happen to believe in evolution. I could say some scientists drive Fords, some scientists drive Chevys. It doesn't mean the Ford has anything to do with science or the Chevy has something to do with science. The fact that he believes in evolution and also is a scientist does not mean there's a connection. And you've got to be careful with that, okay? Everybody has a religious belief. I have religion. Everybody has some kind of religious belief, okay? Even atheists. So. The fact that a scientist happens to believe in evolution doesn't mean what he believes in is scientific. He's just mixing his religion with his science. Also, you have to watch who gets to decide who is a scientist. The word science means knowledge. So a person who is in the pursuit or study of knowledge is a scientist. Also, if you look at what happened in the Soviet Union, you know, 10 years ago, if a teacher stood up in class and said, kids, <coughs> I don't believe in communism. Capitalism is a much better system. What would happen to that teacher? Gulag, all right? <laughs> Siberia, huh? You like snow, huh? Yeah, we can fix that, right? If they survived, then the teachers get up in school and say, all teachers believe in evolution, or all teachers believe in communism, or whatever. They try to use this. See, anybody who wants to use majority opinion as an argument, as some kind of evidence, red flags ought to go up all over the place. Hold on just a minute. Majority opinion doesn't mean a thing. 
you go to a headhunting society, the majority believes it's okay to cut somebody's head off and eat them. Well, it doesn't mean it's right. And so what they do, they try to silence the opposition. Rather than using logic, they use intimidation. And if a scientist does not go along with what everybody else believes, he's likely to lose his job. A couple days ago, Dan and I sat in the living room of Robert Gentry in T Knoxville, Tennessee, who worked at Oak Ridge Laboratories. He's a scientist. He was one of the world's experts on the disposal of nuclear waste. But he, he wrote all sorts of articles. They were published in all sorts of major journals until they found out he's a creationist. Right away, shut him off. Nobody will publish anything he writes anymore. Because if they do, then they're giving credibility to a creationist. And they want to be able to stand up and say, you creationists never publish in scientific journals. Well, yeah, we try, but you won't take our stuff. So that's like somebody standing up in the Soviet Union saying, well, hey, you know, capitalists, uh, there aren't any capitalist teachers. Obviously, it can't be good. And it doesn't take a freshman law student to figure that out. That's not good logic. But the technique uh, that the media uses all the time is to try to divide religion from science. We'll get into more when we get into seminar part four of how Charles Lyell did that in his book, Principles of Geology, back in, clear back in 1830. He's one of the guys, there are many people in the early 1800s, who tried to drive a wedge between the Bible and science. Truth of the matter is, all of the branches of science were started by creationists. From 1600s, 1700s, all the major branches of science. I defy people to name me one advancement we have in scientific information because of the evolution theory. Is that why we have light bulbs, computers, plastics, space shuttles? What, what good has the evolution theory done? Come up with some during, during the course. Or if you watch our video, send me some. I would like to know what good has the theory done. See, if a person believes there's a creator, then he's going to look for design and order in nature. Why did the, why did the creator do it that way? Oh, I bet there's a reason for that. Let me think what it is. One guy named Murray was reading his Bible one day, and it says uh, in Psalm chapter 8, Whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. He said, I wonder if there are paths in the sea. You know, when they sailed from Europe over to America, they took the shortest route. Murray spent a lifetime studying currents in the ocean and discovered because of ocean currents, they could save an awful lot of time instead of taking the short route across the middle follow the current. It's longer, but you get there faster. It's like having a tailwind the whole time. He got that from the Bible. You know, the Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. People read that and say, wow. Up until, you know, a lot of people used to take, they take their blood out to help them get well. Clear up until 1860, they did bloodletting. And the Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. You can study the hit. There's a good book called... Uh, Men of Science, Men of God, published by uh, ICR, carries it. I don't know if they publish it, but uh, you can get icr.org and get it from them. A great book. Men of Science, Men of God, showing a lot of the godly scientists of the past. You ever heard of an MRI machine? Magnetic Resonance Imaging. The guy who invented that is a creationist, loves God, believes the Bible. Is he a scientist? Oh, yeah. But see, to the average evolutionist, that guy would not qualify as a scientist because he believes in creation. So if they define the terms, who's a scientist, of course they will win the argument. And that's how they do it. That's what they're trying to do here. They're trying to define the terms. And you've got to watch for that constantly. According to the creationist, 6,000 years ago God did it. According to the evolutionist, 20 billion years ago it just happened by itself. Now, these two timelines are not the same scale. On the top timeline here, every inch is a 150 years, which is a long time. Abe Lincoln was not even president one inch ago. Columbus was running around trying to find this place right there. The Vikings were going around beating up on everybody right there, right? If I was to try to show you what 20 billion years looks like at this scale, this chart would actually need to be 2,100 miles long. 
from Pensacola to Portland, Oregon. 6,000 years does not even show up on that chart. I cannot draw a line thin enough to represent 6,000 years. So they're hiding behind long ago and far away. <laughs> and if somehow the brain can't accept that. The brain shuts off and says, wow, it must be true. And if you tell a, tell a big lie, they're more likely to believe it. And that's exactly what's happened. Now, the basic questions that you need to ask are, where did the matter come from? Where did the laws come from? And where did the energy come from? I ask that to evolutionists all the time. Okay, you say there was a big bang. Please tell, help me now. Where did the matter come from? What exploded? They don't know, of course. Secondly, where did the laws come from? Notice the universe is run by laws. The law of gravity, for instance. Why do objects attract each other? <clears throat> How does the earth know my pen is here? If I drop it, how long will it take the earth to figure out where it is and start pulling on it? Instantly, right? How did it know that? If I was somehow able to create something instantly from nothing in the middle of the air, a hundred miles above the earth, how long would it take to begin falling? Where did this, what, what is gravity anyway? Give me a jar of it, would you please? Nobody has a clue what it is. We use it all the time, obviously, or you'd be sitting on the ceiling or something. But we don't, but nobody knows what it is, and we sure don't know why, why do we have this interesting force called gravity, or inertia, or centrifugal force. I mean, there are hundreds of forces in the universe. Where did they come from? Who made them? And why are they so precise? Thirdly, where did all this energy come from? Energy and matter are sort of interchangeable, but anytime you change from one to the other, you have a tremendous loss. So basically, where did the matter, where did the energy came from? It's sort of two sides of the same coin. But these are things the evolutionist simply doesn't know. I use the merry-go-round illustration in my seminar uh, this, because it illustrates something called the conservation of, law of conservation of angular momentum. If you put kids on the merry-go-round and get it spinning, as it goes faster and faster and faster, eventually, of course, the kids are going to go flying off the merry-go-round. Now, when the kid flies off, if the merry-go-round is going clockwise, the kid will be spinning clockwise as he exits. The reason for this is, if you can imagine the circle spinning, the outside has to move faster than the inside. It's got further to go in the same amount of time. And because of that, if it cracks up in a frictionless environment, now that's key, okay, this would only work in a frictionless environment. And that's what the Big Bang Theory says, all the matter was in one dot. Well, if all the matter is in one dot, then you have a totally frictionless environment. There's nothing for it to hit on the way out. So if, and they said it was spinning, and it exploded. Well, then all of the fragments should be spinning the same way. But yet, they're not. Venus and Uranus, and possibly Pluto, they're not quite sure yet. Last I heard, they don't know for sure which way Pluto spins, but they think it may be spinning backwards to the other six. Here we have six planets spinning one way, two and possibly three spinning the other way. And it's not just two planets together. Venus and Uranus have several planets in between. So why do two planets spin backwards? One atheist I debated said, well, maybe something hit Venus and spun it around backwards. I said, well, I suppose that's possible, but think about it for a minute. Do you realize what it would take to reverse the spin of a planet? Don't you think it would leave a dent at least? <laughs> Where is the dent? Why is Venus nearly perfectly round and near in a nearly perfectly circular orbit? Imagine a planet spinning and at the same time going around the sun. I want you to strike it so that it simply reverses the spin without knocking it into an elliptical orbit or knocking it out of orbit. Chances of that is zero. That ain't going to happen. Then not only do we have that problem, we have at least six of the 63 moons. I think there are more moons now that have been discovered. But at this time, there were in 1989, they knew about 63 moons. Six of them are spinning backwards. Some of them actually travel backwards around their planet. I believe, I'd have to look it up, but two planets, yeah, Saturn and Neptune, there it is right there, 
have moons orbiting both directions. Here you got a planet. Some of the moons are going this way. Other moons are going this way. Now, as these moons pass each other, there's going to be a slight gravitational tug. How long can a system like that last before it slowly disintegrates? They drift off into space. Certainly not forever. You'd agree with that, right? Is there some kind of time limit here? I don't know what it is, but I would think logic would say, yeah, there's an obvious time limit. Can't be, it can't have happened for billions of years. So if, I, if somebody says the universe was created 6,000 years ago by an all-wise creator, well, then this is no problem. Stuff like this poses no problem for the creationist, but I think it does for those who want to say it's billions and billions of years old. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3 and in the book of Psalms, identical verse, part of the verse, says, The heavens shall pass away with a great noise. Might be a good bonus question. If you can find out which psalm says the heavens shall pass away. Um, So the New Testament writer here is quoting an Old Testament verse about the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat, and the earth shall be burned up. Jehovah's Witnesses teach the earth is going to last forever. Is that what the Bible teaches? No. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. So these guys teaching the earth is going to last forever simply don't read their Bible. They're wrong. All right? So. This is the Big Bang in the Bible, the great noise. If somebody says, do you believe in the Big Bang? I say, oh, yes, I do, and you better get saved and get ready for it. The Big Bang is coming soon to a city near you. <laughs> it's coming, folks. Get ready. Now, the Big Bang theory has some serious problems. First of all, it does not explain where the matter came from. It does not explain where the energy came from. It does not explain where the laws came from. It does not explain why we have retro, what's called retrograde motion. Another problem with the Big Bang that they've really tried to avoid is the fact that if there were a Big Bang, the matter should be fairly evenly distributed throughout space. But it's not. It is clumpy. There's, there's a whole bunch of stuff together called a galaxy, and in zillions of miles and nothing. How much space is there between here and Mars, for instance? What, about 45 million miles at the closest? Between here and the sun, 93 million miles, roughly. There's a whole lot of nothing, folks. Just plain nothing. Big Bang Theory should have everything evenly distributed, and it just simply isn't that way. There's a great article in Creation Magazine, December 99, about the physics behind the Big Bang, how it just can't be true. By the way, if you want to really get a fascinating magazine, to, it only comes once every th uh, three months, and it's 22 bucks a year, so you get four copies. Well worth it, though. Creation Magazine, I'll give you a number you can call if you want to get that. Awesome articles, just w very well done. It's 800-350-3232. Uh, That'd be a magazine well worth subscribing to, 800-350-3232. That's up in, uh, published in Australia, actually. Creation Ex Nihilo is the name of it. And the back issues are like five bucks each, and they've been doing this since, well, ten years. If you really want to get a tremendous library, you, you could spend $100 probably and get all of the back issues, and just or maybe $200 or something. It's just really, really good stuff in there, enough to read for a long time. But that article is, uh, it to goes into the science behind the Big Bang Theory. It's just a big dud. The second law of thermodynamics, and we must hurry here, says everything is tending toward disorder. Now, there are several different ways this is phrased, okay? Some people say, uh, in any exchange, there's a net loss. You know, several ways this is, this is phrased. All right. Who can define thermodynamics? Tanya, heat power. Very good. Heat power. Um, What is another more uh, common term for cosmic evolution? Big bang. Big bang. Cameraman, Eric. All right, sorry about that. Let's see, the origin of life would be which one? Organic, Organic evolution. A crazen, there we go, all right. Uh, let's see, the origin of uh, 
time space matter would be cosmic evolution, Big Bang. Uh, here we go, okay. <laughs> when was the Humanist Manifesto first written, the first one? 1933. 33. There we go. Got several got that one. 1933. Oh, oh, that's over there, end of the table. Don't eat that. Okay. Um, the word universe means single spoken sentence. Universe. There we go. All right. You, get, you didn't get that one, did you? Steve got it. Universe. Single spoken sentence. Uh, how many times did Lucifer say, I will? Five, Five times. Oh, hey, everybody got one. Go give everybody one. Okay. Give them one. Just one. I just want you want to their appetite. Okay. What is the Bible word that means the enlightened one? Lucifer. Lucifer. Very good. Right there. He got it right there at the end of that table. Okay. Okay, so the second law of thermodynamics tells us basically it boils down to what it means is if you leave something alone for a while, it's either going to rot or rust or die or fall apart or break down. Absolutely nothing improves with time. Everything is disintegrating, disintegrating. Just take a look in the mirror and you will see, okay? <laughs> Wrinkles, <laughs> things just fall apart, right? Now, the Bible teaches that in Hebrews chapter 1, the heavens are the works of thy hands, they shall perish. They wax old as doth a garment. I believe this is also repeating one of the Psalms, if you want to find that one. There's an Old Testament reference that the New Testament author is simply reiterating what he said. Everything is basically wearing out. It'll wax old as doth a garment. Garments gradually wear out. Fibers slowly eat against each other and fragments fly off and make dust and pretty soon it's real thin and then pretty soon it, it falls apart. The universe is falling apart. Um, this happens, you can see it, you can observe everything getting worse with time. Take a look at your hairdo when you wake up in the morning. You'll see what I'm talking about. Maybe you fellas can help me. I've been trying to figure something out for a long time. I've been married 27 years now. My daughter's 20. Why does it take the girls an hour of hard work in the morning? in order to look natural. <laughs> if you're trying to look natural, get up and go to work. <laughs> That's natural, right? <laughs> no, that nobody wants to look natural. You don't want to smell natural either, do you? <laughs> That's why we have whole sections of the store to sell stuff to overcome the second law of thermodynamics. Did you know nearly everybody in the world is employed because of the second law of thermodynamics? You are either fixing something that somebody else made because it's wearing out now and breaking, or you're building a new something because the last one broke. <laughs> really, if you think about it, that law employs just about the entire population of the world. We have to work to just to maintain. If you don't exercise, go work out. Your second law of thermodynamics will take over, won't it? <laughs> one guy said, I'm a bodybuilder. I'm building a big one. Look at this. <laughs> um, that's just a fact of science, folks. Everything's falling apart. But I want you to see what the textbook says. HBJ Earth Science says, humans probably evolved from bacteria. Now hold it just a minute. Which of the six meanings of evolution would that be? Macro, changing from one kind to another. Has anybody ever observed that? No. Bacteria are still having babies, and they're bacteria. Right? Humans have humans. Cats have cats. Nothing's ever been observed to indicate this is true. But this is, gonna, this is in a probably an eighth or ninth grade earth science book where they tell the kids humans probably evolved from bacteria that lived more than four billion years ago. Now in this book they stretched it to four billion. As we go through the course, I'll show you lots of different textbooks, the number ranges all over from three billion to four billion. Now, if the universe began 4.6 billion years ago, by the way, in 1905, you can look it up in an old encyclopedia, they officially say the Earth is 2 billion years old. Just 100 years ago, they were saying it's 2 billion years old. Now they're saying it's 4.6 billion years old. Guess what it'll be in another 50 years? Something bigger, bigger number, right? <laughs> 
The solution is always add more time. Back in 1770, they were saying it is 70,000 years old. The earth is getting older, about 21 million years per minute, I believe. It's gaining, <laughs> getting old fast. Uh, this textbook shows the kids a fossil starfish, and it says, Nearly 3.4 billion years old, the remains of the early ancestors of modern human beings. Was your great-great-great-great-great-great-grandpa a starfish? Isn't this answering the question, where did, where did I come from? Not very well, <laughs> but that's what they're trying to answer, isn't it? Evolution is a religion that seeks to answer the four great questions of life. Where did I come from? Oh, I came from starfish. Look at this one. 30 million years ago, I stop right there. I say, kids, let me translate that for you. What that really means is, long ago and far away. It means a fairy tale is coming next. That's your warning <laughs> right there. Fairy tale coming up. 30 million years ago, these creatures evolved. Now, there's that word again. It says they are ancestral to both humans and modern apes. Now, hold on a minute. <clears throat> Apes are still having babies, aren't they? Why don't they produce another human? Only this time, let's watch it. See how it happens long ago and far away, but it can't happen in the present? They're hiding behind something that cannot be observed. It's not science. What they're saying is, that's Grandpa. Now, well, subconsciously, what does this do to the kid? Well, I'm just an animal. So, if I have animal instincts, it's normal, it's natural. Can you see how this ties in? Barbara Reynolds figured it out. She's a liberal journalist. Your kids go ape in school, here's why. Right there, she said, he's being taught evolution. Johnny, you're an animal. Uh, really? This book used right here. Washington High School uses it. Tate High School uses it. Uh, Pensacola High School uses it. That book right now, they're using it now. You are an animal. Share a common heritage with earthworms. Oh, you mean I'm just an animal? Huh, okay. <laughs> and you wonder. Some of them make you wonder, don't they, you know? Here we sit back and wonder, why do the kids act like animals? Well, look what you're teaching them. And then the idiot news, when some kid shoots another kid in school, which is happening all the time these days, last week, they jump on the gun control issue, don't they? They're trying to focus the attention away from the real problem, which is what we're teaching them. You ought to get some of the school books, or some of the articles about the ten most common problems in school in 1870. Chewing gum. Late to class. What would the teachers list now as the ten most common problems? Guns in school. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> this is all part of the plan, folks. There's a much bigger plan behind all this. Uh, the whole purpose of public education, free government education, was Karl Marx's idea. 1846 or 48, the Communist Manifesto. He gave 10 things to do to destroy a country, to make it communist. Number 10 on his list was free government education. Nine or 10. We're going to look at it. We get into more of that in video number five, how this ties together. But we teach the kids they're an animal, and we stand back and marvel that they act like animals. If a kid thinks, you know, I'm made in God's image, and I'm going to stand before God someday, that may not stop him from doing every crime, but it'll sure help, don't you think? It can't hurt. Now, there have been a lot of horrible things done in the name of Christianity and in the name of various religions. I'm aware of all that. Okay. But if you tell all the kids there is no creator, you will never be judged for anything that you do. All he's got to do is figure out a way to get by. He's got to be more clever. That's all. Folks, this philosophy is so dangerous. Next week, we're going to talk about teachers can teach creation science in a public school. I spoke in five public schools last week. Perfectly fine to speak in, or two weeks ago, 
perfectly fine to, fine to teach the Bible in public schools and teach creation in public schools. We'll cover that in the next lesson. Thank you so much. Dismissed.